this podcast. I actually tried to record this episode last night and I got about 80 minutes in, was just about finished, stopped recording and my program crashed. <laughs> so I lost nearly an hour and a half's worth of material. I'm going to try and do it again tonight and remember everything which I said yesterday. No doubt there's going to be some bits which I forget. Hopefully to mitigate that, there'll be some bits which I didn't say last night, which I will say this time, which are potentially interesting. My focus in this episode is war memoirs, specifically the war memoir Jarhead by Anthony Swafford, published in 2003. My copy by Squ- Gribner or Scribner, which is an imprint of Simon and Schuster. And I suppose mainly I want to talk about truth in memoirs, specifically truth in war memoirs, whether we get any truth from them, how reliable they are as as historical documents to find out what actually happened during the wars which they depict and maybe some other interesting thoughts on ideas on the concept of truth in writing in general and in literature. And on top of that, I'd like to talk a little bit about masculinity because it's quite a prominent theme in the memoir. And to achieve these two goals, I suppose, I am going to be comparing Jarhead to several memoirs written about the Vietnam War from various combatants in that war because I have read a lot about that because they're my main source for my master's thesis and because the Vietnam War is my favourite war. (laughs) The reason I wanted to talk about this was because in the very first chapter of Swafford's Jarhead, which is a memoir based on his experiences fighting or rather not fighting in the Gulf War in, well, the Gulf War between Iraq and Kuwait in the early 1990s, the the, the turn of that decade, in fact. He's based in Saudi Arabia and recounts his experiences mostly being in the desert with lots of flashbacks of his life before the Marines and lots of jumps forwards to how his life was after the Marines, or at least after this war, because he was part of the military for a long time afterwards. But yeah, in the introduction, he writes, As a lance corporal in a US Marine Corps scout sniper platoon, I saw more of the Gulf War than the average grunt. Still, my vision was blurred, by wind and sand and distance, by false signals, poor communication and bad coordinates, by stupidity and fear and ignorance by valour and false pride, by the mirage. Thus what follows is neither true nor false, but what I know. And this is where I want to start with how memoirists regard the writing which they are doing. Because from my experience of reading war memoirs, there's kind of two camps. There's a camp of memoirists who say that they are writing what happened exactly as they remember it, and any mistakes are not really through any fault of their own. Then there's another camp of memoirists, specifically war war memoirists, who who say that they realise that lots of what they're going to be writing is going to be made up, essentially, and isn't going to be the truth. And they're happy to admit that. For example, there's a collection of oral histories by an editor called Mark Baker, who writes in his introduction, included here are generalizations, exaggerations, braggadocia, and very likely outright lies. He continues, this book is not the truth about Vietnam, but these war stories may bring us closer to the truth than we have come so far. So Mark Baker realizes that what he's doing in his, what the soldiers are doing who who he collects in his book, aren't necessarily going to be telling the truth. Some of it may be completely untrue, but 
th- almost through that untruth, there is something which can be gained from reading the stories, which is kind of the point of literature, the point of fiction, that there is some wider, greater truth exposed through the fictitious nature of the narrative. Interestingly, then, as I mentioned, not all of these memoirists do that. Robert Mason, for example, wrote a memoir called Chicken Hawk. It's really good. I recommend it. It's not the most beautifully written memoir of all of them, but there are some really, really excellent parts in it, and it's insightful and engaging. And he writes at the beginning quite confidently, actually. He says, all of the events happened, which he qualifies by then saying, the chronology and geography are correct to the best of my knowledge. Robert Mason thinks that everything that he writes is the actual truth, that these events all happened, that none of it is made up, none of it is fake. And as I hope to be able to show, that's simply not true. And we can't really trust any of these memoirists. Before we get to that, W.D. Earhart in his collection of letters home from soldiers also in Vietnam to their family and friends, writes in his introduction, there's no willful distortion of facts, but whatever inaccuracies the book contains are errors of recollection or perception. So he doesn't admit, as Mark Baker does, that the soldiers could just be lying, telling things which are straightforwardly not true, but that their memories have simply failed them, which is something we'll come back to. And the final comparison I'd like to make here is from Joanne Puffer Kocha, who wrote a memoir called The Diary of a Donut Dolly. The Donut Dollies were support workers, basically, always women, who would fly over to war zones from America and offer the soldiers, for example, emotional support. They would give them female company, they would serve them meals, and to the best of my knowledge... It was never of a sexual nature. It was always to give them a taste of America and make them kind of remember what they were fighting for. And she writes in her introduction to her memoir of her time in Vietnam, which is based on her diary, her memoir recounts what she saw and did, what she felt and thought, a faithful representation of that time, which is interesting because of the words that she uses. She calls it a representation, so she realises she's not showing us exactly what happened. She's giving us a representation of what happened. At the same time, she says what she felt and thought, fine. We can, to some extent, trust that those were her emotions at the time, although we'll get back to that as well, and that's not necessarily true either. But that's also fine. But then she also says what she saw and did. Maybe what she saw and what she thought she did isn't actually the truth, in inverted commas, in any meaningful sense, although perhaps in a useful sense. So let's get into this. Uh, it's a really interesting topic for me. It's a big part of my master's thesis and I wanted to talk about it today because it keeps coming up again and again as I read memoirs and it came up again when I read Jarhead, which I've been meaning to read for ages. I really, really loved the film. The film was directed by Sam Mendes and stars Jake Gyllenhaal and Jamie Foxx and was really, really good. I thought I've seen it a load of times because I always really, really liked it. So to begin with, it's important to take into account the fact that Memoirs themselves and the people who write them, they don't always necessarily think that they're writing the truth. There's a paper I read on this which argues that memoirs are neither history nor memory, but deeply rooted in both, which makes them kind of a hybrid of history in the sense of this is what these people are writing happened at this moment in time, and at the same time their memory, which in some sense makes them literature, because memory it could be argued, is essentially just imagination. This means that memoirs are super unreliable, but at the same time really, really valuable, because, you know, you get information on a personal level, and you get impressions of how a writer was feeling, the perspective they had, their experiences, and they offer a kind of a vivid and narrative interpretation of what happened, which isn't necessarily what happened in real life, but it's valuable in its own right. And it gives you insights into kind of the human condition. And war memoirs are very, very concerned with the human condition. And often they're written by men, not all of them, such as the Donut Dolly memoir by Puffer Kocha, which is a really funny name. Um, But they, they often focus on themes of masculinity, what it means to be a man and to go and fight a war as a man and 
how wars contribute to masculinity and stuff like that. Stuff that you could kind of predict going in. And lots of academics who talk about memoirs say that the past should be remembered differently. And that is to say they should be remembered emotionally rather than literally. Even if it's desirable to make memoirs as true to the events that happened, in inverted commas, as possible. It's inevitable that that's not going to be possible because, quote, we grow, change and hopefully learn from our experiences, end quote, which means that our memories change as well. Of course, our memories change as we get older and as we grow and in 10 years how you remember an event is not going to be the same as how you remember it now. What might be a good memory now may turn into an embarrassing one later. What might be a bad memory now in 10 years you may take a positive experience from it and it is no longer bathed in this horrible negative light that it once was. In relation to Jarhead specifically, I read online from a source which I cannot corroborate and I cannot say whether this is true or not, so take it with a grain of salt or a pinch of salt, whatever the expression is, but I read that his memoir isn't actually a faithful representation of his experiences, but is kind of a collection of stories he heard while he was fighting there. He put them all together in this book and made this narrative structure, which takes him on a journey through the war, what he learns from it, well, the reasons he went and how he developed while he was fighting or not fighting as the case may be, because the memoir focuses on the fact that he never fired his gun. That's a really, really big part of it. And a big part is the, the fact that he didn't manage to kill anyone while he was over there. All issues of masculinity, which I'll talk about a little bit later, I guess. And he puts it into this narrative perspective, but we don't really know whether all of these things actually happened to Swafford, how much of it was stolen from other people that he served with, if any. As I say, I can't corroborate the source and I can't evidence the claim, <laughs> but it's interesting if it's true because there's a very famous memoir by Michael Hare called Dispatches. It's probably the most famous memoir to come out of the Vietnam War. In an interview which Hare had with the LA Times, he said to the interviewer, a lot of Dispatches is fictional. I've said this a lot of times. I never thought of Dispatches as journalism. In France, they published it as a novel which is really, really interesting. And in the same interview, he says that lots of the stories that were told by soldiers were either put together from disparate stories which he heard, or they were stories which maybe he just completely made up. And the people who told them, the soldiers that he recounts in dispatches, lots of them were composite characters made up of two, three, sometimes even four different people that he met there. He put them all together and made this character that he has a that he includes in a scene. So the people didn't exist, and even the stuff that they're recounting is completely fake, or it's it's some kind of amalgamation of the truth or of events, and you can't even know how much it, of it is true because the stories which he got told may themselves have not been true. So he might be putting, he might have put together stories which were already lies or exaggerations or, you know, miscommunications. So there's something really interesting in that, I think, that memoirists, although they kind of, on the face of it, purport to be writing events which actually happened, they also at the same time know that they're not. And her, I mean, at least in this interview, says, I've said this a lot of times, and he says that it was published in France as a novel, but... Most people who read that in the English-speaking world are not going to know that, and they're going to think, I think these people are going to form their opinions based on these memoirs. And if your memoir is essentially completely untrue, then that's important for kind of the, the zeitgeist of the age and the, the general public's perspective on a certain set of events, because it can completely distort them. So there's all of this going on about whether memoirs are truth, the truth or not, whether they should be, whether they're just meant to represent the emotional truth of the writer, what, that, what the writer perceived, specifically what they perceived after the event. And at the same time, it's important to discuss how notoriously unreliable memory is, because our memories are actually really, really dreadful, and we know this. One of my favourite examples of this is... A paper I read a long, long time ago called Neural Correlates of Reactivation and Retrieval Induced Distortion. Basically, the argument is people recall memories, obviously. 
When they recall memories more often, the strength of those memories gets reinforced. So something that you remember a lot of the time, you're more likely to be able to recall again in the future. And stuff that you don't think about that often, you're more liable to forget and potentially forget completely. However, when you're recalling a memory, you often, not infrequently, make mistakes in recalling it. So you recall a memory, but you make a mistake, but the very fact that you've thought about that event means that you've already reinforced it, which means you can reinforce a mistake into your memory. And then the next time, if you remember it the same with the mistake that you remembered the last time, which didn't actually happen, you reinforce it even more. And in X amount of time, you have a memory which is potentially completely incorrect because your brain has just reinforced the mistakes which you remembered into your memories, which is super interesting, I think. And also, and quite terrifying, I think, to know that actually our memories are kind of fake. And what we think we're remembering correctly, we might not be at all. At the same time as this effect, which is kind of my favourite one, I think it's the most interesting at least, there are like a thousand others. There's kind of obvious ones like cognitive bias, where you're more likely to believe statements that back up the opinion you already have. There's another interesting one and quite famous one by a study done by Elizabeth Loftus and John Palmer, who showed a phenomenon called the false memory effect which is a little bit Chris Nolan inception-y in that memories can be implanted into people's brains. So one of the studies they did, for example, participants were asked to, to watch a car crash and they were, received a questionnaire afterwards and some people were given the question, how fast was the car going when it crashed? Other people were given the questionnaire, how fast was the car going when it hit the tree, for example? And others were given collide and others were given bump. And based on the perceived severity of the verb used, so crash, hit, collide, or bump, people would say that the car was travelling either faster or slower, even though they'd all seen exactly the same video. So that shows how language is really, really important. The language you use, how important that is in defining your memory. And it was quite important for police interrogations because police were asking kind of leading questions and influencing people's memories without even realizing it and the people they were interrogating didn't realize it either all of these all of these kind of cognitive biases wikipedia lists lists like 50 presumably there's loads which aren't listed on wikipedia and also loads that we don't know about yet they're all compounded when you're in a traumatic situation which affects your mental health such as war there's a really interesting study i read where it said that up to 98% of military personnel who fight in a war for more than 60 days are afflicted by some sort of psychiatric illness. I don't know what the figures are for the Gulf War, but with regards to Vietnam, they think that perhaps more than half of all Vietnam War veterans experience post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. More than half experience just that one psychiatric illness. Imagine how many experienced, I mean, even minor things, like minor depression, minor anxiety, or manic depression, bipolar disorder, extreme cases of anxiety and, and depression. Lots of the memoirists that I have read talk about this. Some of them experience it while they're there. Swafford experiences it while he's there, for example, in Jarhead, while he has the barrel of his gun stuck in his mouth and he's not sure about whether, committing, whether he wants to commit suicide or not. His friend Troy comes in and stops him in the end. He writes what might be my favourite passage... Perhaps I wouldn't have pulled the trigger. My despair is less despair than boredom and loneliness. Maybe Troy's good timing saved me. I think about my sister, this very minute living in an institution in California, and I consider myself a poor imposter, an actor speaking the wrong lines. I don't know what I want, but I obviously don't want badly enough to be dead. I think about Hemingway. What a shot. What despair. What courage. Some insist that the suicide is both a coward and a cheat, but I think the suicide is rather courageous. To look at one's life and decide that it's not worth living, than to go through with the horrible act. Millions of people live lives that aren't worth living. Many fewer people end their worthless lives. To look down the barrel of the gun, or over the lip of the pill bottle, and say, that is what I want. That is the world that needs me. Better than breath. Better than banging my bones through the remainder of these sorry days. There is the courageous man and woman, the suicide. But I don't own the courage to kill myself.
I must return to the thing I know best, possibly the only thing I truly know, being a jarhead. Maybe a slightly corny ending to the passage, but I think really, really interesting. Highlights what I was talking about before with how many soldiers experienced mental health problems, not only after the war, but while they were there. At this point, Swafford must have been in country more than 60 days, but I'm not quite sure. They're still kind of at like, I, I don't know what the term is, but like in the rear, basically, and they're waiting to go and actually fight properly. To link this back round, this also affects memory and the memories of soldiers who write memoirs. Depression is really, really bad for your memory. Details escape you when you have depression. You, it's really difficult for you to find details in situations, even as kind of big memory remains intact. And Jarhead is an extremely detailed memoir. There are parts where he's just listing gear and talking about expressions on people's faces and very specific conversations. Depression has a negative effect on all of those things. And my point is, there's one more reason kind of not to trust war memoirs. Of course, trusting them isn't the most important thing. The memoir is also written for the writer, perhaps should only be written for the writer. And there's an interesting article by Susanna Redstone, in which she argues it's widely accepted that personal accounts of the past do not necessarily offer direct access to the past. My point is, these memoirs don't offer the actual past. They offer an emotional truth. And this statement rings all the more true for soldiers for whom this emotional, this emotional truth is perhaps extremely important in overcoming their trauma. That's pretty couch psychology, but you never know. There's one more main point I'd like to make about memory before I kind of... I suppose, leave this section of this episode and move into probably a relatively brief discussion of masculinity in Jarhead and with reference to other memoirs. And it's how memoirs are political documents. A war memoir always has an, an intent. And interestingly, lots of memoirists say that their work is non-political. And it's just very obviously not true. Because in the same article which I first quoted which is by an author called Jura Avazinius. The writer argues memory is deliberately chosen by a group to serve particular uses. I think that's relatively uncontroversial. I think when it comes to wars specifically, there's so much inherent political value, it's just impossible to get away from. Philip Caputo wrote a memoir called A Rumour of War. It's perhaps the second most famous Vietnam War memoir. It's really, really excellent. I recommend it so much. Maybe after you've listened to me, you don't want to read it because you can't trust anything that's in it but just read it as a novel it's really fantastic it's beautifully written for me it's in a long canon of war literature that includes Sassoon and Wilfred Owen and all of the rest anyway he writes right in his introduction this book has nothing to do with politics but it's self-evident for me that a book about Vietnam one of the most important wars by a western state for changing the political landscape of a whole country, the USA, and therefore by extension lots of Europe, is going to be political. Of course it is. And later in his memoir, in Caputo's memoir, he talks about his involvement in the anti-war movement. There's no way that those later memories don't affect how he writes it. Interestingly, he was in C Company, the first company of troops to actually have boots on the ground, as they say in Vietnam in 1965, Robert Mason, who wrote Chicken Hawk, which I mentioned earlier, was in the 1st Helicopter Cavalry Regiment, and therefore Robert Mason's cavalry were flying lots of C Company soldiers. And I've wondered, since I read both of them, whether they ever met. And then they both wrote what were both quite successful memoirs about the war from different perspectives, which essentially say the same kind of things and have a similar narrative structure. And I wonder if, if Philip Caputo was ever in a helicopter with Robert Mason and they just never knew it. To move on to Robert Mason, Mason also mentions that he had no idea about any of the history or politics of Vietnam when he went there. He just wanted to fly helicopters. He loved flying. He was like made to fly or whatever. And he kind of implies later on that his having learned of the history of Vietnam, the colonialist practices which went on there by the French before him influenced his opinion on the war. His memoir comes out sometime, came out sometime in the mid-80s. Presumably he wasn't writing it for that long before. There's no way he was writing it for 20 years before that. Although I suppose it's possible. But regardless, 
his learning of the history and politics of Vietnam is of course going to have influenced how he wrote his memoir. And to say that that's not true is so disingenuous from both of them, I think. To be so unself aware to think that your political opinions after the fact aren't going to affect how you write about an event that happened i mean for for caputo 12 years before for robert mason 20 years i think i just think that's so disingenuous and so unself aware that's my main criticism of them so building on that apart from the fact that memoirs themselves are kind of political documents in the sense that they have authors who have their own opinions and politics and perspectives. It's also interesting to think about how a memoir isn't only written, and this applies to all books, but it's not only written by the author. There's a collection of people who read the book, who proofread the book, either during or after the writing stage. Friends, family, hired editors, the so-called beta readers. And on top of that, even in the process of getting published, and I'm only here talking about memoirs which have been published, there's a publisher to go through who needs a certain thing from the book. And there'll be an editor who works for that publisher who's going to change stuff, he's going to get you to change stuff. And that all influences how the memoirs are written, particularly for collections, like Jarhead maybe is, Dispatches kind of is as well. There's a political uh, decision made in how you how you order these things. So there's a there's a collection which I mentioned earlier by Edelman. He writes in the introduction to the book of letters which he's edited. No pretense is made that these represent a complete account of the perceptions of soldiers in the war zone. Regardless of that, they collected all of these letters together, who got sent in by friends, family, veterans. And they they ordered them in such a way as that it would relate to a complete year's tour in Vietnam. But that might not have been the case of exactly how it worked. These narrative structures are basically completely constructed. And there's an interesting book I read called Vietnam War Stories by Toby C. Herzog. And he writes that this type of literature doesn't look to recount what actually happened, but strives to a higher level of literary truth. And he notices how in all of the memoirs he reads, there are, com- there are common narratives which run through all of this war literature. So there's kind of this theme of, for example, expectation versus reality, which leads to a recurring three-part structure, almost like three acts of a play, which are innocence, experience, and consideration. So these soldiers come in relatively innocent in terms of their war experiences, They then have the experiences and then they consider them afterwards and they find their lessons from what happened to them. Then there's other interesting things that he talks about, like how in almost every memoir I read from the Vietnam War, there was one mention of John Wayne. I didn't find mention of John Wayne in Jarhead, but it was surprising to not see it in there. John Wayne is this like apotheosis of every soldier's favourite war hero. It's crazy. So there are these there are these kind of common tropes, these common themes which run through all of them, and presumably that has something to do with the publishing process. You can't just write a collection of vignettes and expect it to do well. There has to be a narrative, there has to be a beginning, a middle and an end, there has to be a climax and a resolution. And all of these books essentially have that in one way or another, some far more obviously than others. Caputo's, for example, reads like a novel. It has a very, very obvious build-up to a climax and then a resolution at the end. Jarhead to an extent, but it's a little more, I don't want to say experimental, that's far too strong, but it takes more liberties with its art. Lots of the others, Mason's also builds up to a climax and then comes to this kind of dead-end resolution, which I kind of enjoyed. But regardless, I think that the publishing process has something to do with that because these books have to have that narrative structure in order to sell that's something that we often don't consider, I think, when we read stories which are purportedly true, that the publishing process really, really moulds how much of these memoirs can be believed, how much of them is the actual truth of what happened, in inverted commas once more, and how much of it is kind of the emotional truth, as trite and banal and gross as that sounds, of the author writing. And these are interesting questions, and they're important 
to think about when you go into reading a memoir. Because if you go in expecting a history of what happened, then you're either going to be disappointed or you're going to have an extremely false perception of what actually happened. Not to mention that these are just the perspectives of one person who's writing that book, plus, of course, their editors who told them, look, you need to make this more sexy. I suppose that's most of what I had to say about truth in memoirs. Now I guess I'm just going to go through some of the bits of Jarhead that stuck out to me in terms of how Anthony Swafford deals with masculinity and what it means to be a man going to war. He mentions in various points throughout the book that the reason he wanted to join the Marines was because that was what it meant for him to be a man when he was a younger, well, when he was a child even, and when he was a teenager, and when he finally became a man legally. In one part, he talks about how he had a a United States Marine patch, which he bought, which he got his mum to iron on to one of his t-shirts, and he said he wore it religiously. Near the beginning as well, for example, he's talking about how just before they fly out from America to go to Saudi Arabia, where they're based, there's a nice passage when he's talking about the war movies that they that him and his brothers in arms watch in order to hype themselves up. And he writes, There is talk that many Vietnam War films are anti-war, that the message is war is inhumane, and look what happens when you train young American men to fight and kill. They turn their fighting and killing everywhere. They ignore their targets and desecrate the entire country, shooting fully automatic, forgetting they were trained to aim. But actually, Vietnam War films are all pro-war no matter what the supposed message, what Kubrick or Coppola or Stone intended. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson in Omaha or San Francisco or Manhattan will watch the films and weep and decide once and for all that war is inhumane and terrible, and they will tell their friends at church and their family this. But Corporal Johnson at Camp Pendleton, and Sergeant Johnson at Travis Air Force Base, and Seaman Johnson at Coronado Naval Station, and Spec 4 Johnson at Fort Bragg, and Lance Corporal Swafford at 29 Palms Marine Corps Base, watch the same films and are excited by them, because the magic brutality of the film celebrates the terrible and despicable beauty of their fighting skills. Fight, rape, war, pillage, burn. Filmic images of death and carnage are pornography for the military man. With this film, you are stroking his cock, tickling his balls with the pink feather of history, getting him ready for his real first fuck. It doesn't matter how many Mr. and Mrs. Johnson's are anti-war. The actual killers who know how to use the weapons are not. I really liked this image of Marines watching anti-war films and <laughs> using them to bolster their own masculinity and, and most importantly, using them to get themselves hyped up for what they have to go and do, even when people like Coppola and Stone and Kubrick are actually making films which are really quite viciously anti-war. I found the the irony in the passage quite interesting, and I can so imagine it being the truth as well. The fact that his father served in Vietnam. Swafford writes, My father's age and the family back home and his proclivities towards scotch and beer placed him in the population rarely depicted in the literature and films of the Vietnam War. He was not a crazed, fucked-in-the-head grunt, stoned on uppers or nodding on H. Not a stealthy special forces guru, 19 or 20, the perfect age to die. He was a father and a lifer, and while he wasn't necessarily a patriot, he wouldn't be fragging anyone over orders he didn't groove on or dig. He'd build the fucking landing strip in the middle of the gook-thick jungle, and at the end of the day hope for Chivas and Budweiser, write a few letters home, maybe screw a whore in the vill. What happens overseas stays overseas until someone writes about it. I don't know what my father did in the vills of that bombed-out, fucked-out country, but I'll assume... Swafford's family is obviously very important to him. That comes across in the memoir, and even though he admits that his dad wasn't the best dad ever, I don't read much hatred out of it, or any really. More of kind of a sadness that it didn't work out better. He doesn't seem to hold a grudge against anyone in his family. And there's a part where he is writing about how sons can also let their families down. It's relatively early on. Troy, one of his brothers in arms, this is after the war, has already gone home and he dies in an accident in a truck that he was driving, which is his new job. And at the funeral, Swafford writes, Troy's mother was some brand of born-again Christian and I knew she was always unhappy with his drinking and swearing and I also knew that, just like me, he believed in no God. But of course, she had arranged his funeral, not he, and the preacher gave a windy eulogy full of Christ the King as God and on and on and I grew bored with the whole thing. But I thought Troy might want it this way, 
that for all of his disagreements and fights with his mother, if she watched him enter the ground as a believer, he was probably fine with that, because it would help her and probably others. If while alive you hurt or disappoint people you love, there's no use continuing such behaviour when you're dead. I found that also really, really interesting. Kind of comes out of the relatively banal statement that funerals are for the living rather than for the dead, which is obviously very, very true. And I think Swafford writes that in a sense which is related to his masculinity and how he doesn't want to let his family down when he dies. And he realises that he's also made mistakes and that his parents aren't necessarily completely on board with what he's done. His mother and his father both didn't want him to go to war or to join the Marines. And I think that's him really reflecting on himself and what he's going to do when he dies. There's an interesting part which is maybe a little bit banal. He writes, Despite our various disagreements on anything from religion to sports teams to poker rules to the best measurements for breasts, waists and hips, we're a tight platoon. And it doesn't matter whom you train with every day in your team or whether you shat on the same shitter as the famous Vietnam sniper Carlos Hathcock after he delivered the speech at your sniper school graduation. You can look anywhere and you always have a friend. And if need be, because of your stupidity or vanity or selfishness, you also have someone who will slap you or field fuck you or spend a few days telling you what a worthless piece of shit you are until you realise that whatever bug you have up your ass is about a week late in being removed. It's not original to say that the combat unit works like a family, but the best combat unit works like a dysfunctional family, and the ways and means of dysfunction are also the ways and means of survival. It's interesting how these young men who are all often troubled, not always, but the troubled ones seem to fare better in the Marines, how they find this family in the Marines, which some of them have at home, but kind of almost isn't doing it for them. It's almost not enough for these young men. Maybe that's why there's something kind of appealing about being in a group of young men who just kind of beat on each other all the time, but at the same time are always there for one another, even if you don't really like each other. There's a bit here which made me laugh. Uh, <laughs> Swafford's on shitter patrol, which basically means he's got in trouble and he has to pull the barrels of shit out of the wooden squats that the soldiers used. And Swafford writes, Back at the STA hooch, my mates are cleaning their rifles, writing letters, playing cards and sleeping. The first and only scout sniper marine to receive shitter detail in the desert. I will never live it down. Combat action ribbon. All of the other ribbons and medals I'll rate with the platoon. Airborne school. Meritorious corporal. Epic bar fights. Sex pot girlfriends. None in Palm Springs and Hollywood. None of it will matter as much as my shitter detail. For the next two years, barely a week will pass without someone crying, Hey, remember when Swaffy had to burn those shitters in the desert? <laughs> I think that's the... That was one of the bits that made me laugh the most because I just can imagine me and my mates doing exactly the same thing. One of the funny things about doing it is doing it kind of half an hour after it's happened and be like, you remember that time? And also then just bringing it up religiously and torturing the person with it. Yeah, that's my kind of thing. Near to the end, where Swafford writes, I believed I'd enlisted in the Marine Corps in order to claim my place in the military history of my family, the history that included my father's service in Vietnam, his brother dying in the peacetime Marine Corps, and my grandfather serving in the Army Air Force from December 10th, 1941, through the end of World War II. This initial impulse had nothing to do with a desire for combat, for killing, or for a heroic death, but rather was based on my intense need for acceptance into the family clan of manhood. By joining the Marine Corps and excelling within the severely disciplined enlisted ranks, I would prove both my manhood and the masculinity of the line. Also, by enlisting as an infantry grunt, I was outdoing my brother, who'd spent his first few years in the army learning a practical vocation, teeth cleaning. Even before I hit puberty, Jeff and I had been in competition for the dominant male role just junior to our fathers. And I made some notes on this bit, because this is something that doesn't come up quite as directly in the other memoirs. There are some people who joined because other people in their family had joined, and that's just what you did. But nobody talks quite so frankly about their masculinity. Maybe it's a generational thing. Swafford's a younger generation. Maybe that's, it's therefore easier for him to talk a little bit more honestly about this. And I've written it. Is it because in 2003 it's more acceptable to talk about this? Or is it a load of couch psychology? Is he attributing this meaning to him joining the Marine Corps after the act? Or was he aware when he was 10 years old and 14 years old 
At which time, by the way, in the novel, he does talk about the fact that he wants to become a killer and wants to become a really, really good Marine Corps killer. Was he aware when he was 10 and 14 years old that that is exactly why he was joining, that he was doing it to impress his dad, that he was doing it to outdo his brother, that he was doing it to assert, find, back up, reinforce his own masculinity, and therefore the masculinity of the line, as in the line of soldiers that have gone through his family. I'm going to end the episode with the final words of the memoir, which isn't a spoiler, but just as um, a nice insight from Swafford, and refers back to something which happens really early on, which is when a captain comes to him as he's about to order in an airstrike. The captain says, no, give me the handset, I'm going to order the airstrike in. Basically, the captain wants to take credit for himself, and at the time, Swafford's very annoyed. And Swafford writes, Now I often think of the first time I received artillery fire, and the subsequent obliteration of the enemy observation post. I'll never know how many men manned the OP, but in memory I fixed the number at two, and though at the time I was angry that the pompous captain took the handset from me and stole my kills, I have lately been thankful that he insisted on calling the fire mission, and sometimes when I am feeling hopeful or even religious, I think that by taking my two kills, the pompous captain handed me life, some extra moments of living for myself or that I can offer others, though I have no idea how to use or disperse these extra moments or if I've wasted them already. Thank you.